at the same time, of course, the urbanization as it is uh, progressing very rapidly, and there should be also uh, adequate focus on low carbon strategies in the urban area. Uh, the other point that I would like to make is the education. I think a low carbon is a long term process. It cannot happen in one year or two years or five years. I think it is a process which has to continue and the aim should be to make a low carbon approach as a way of life in the society so that it is it continues forever. Uh, for that, I think uh, the people will have to, the younger generation in particular, will have to be educated along the philosophy, along the approach of the low carbon development. I think for that, the greening of education sector, greening, greening of the curricula will be also very important. But to do the greening, there also will have to be educational research, that how to have a good educational curricula that support the low carbon development. So the researchers in the low carbon network also will have done a great service by focusing the agenda of uh, greening the education or greening the curricula. With that, I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ramsan. Uh, in particular, this uh, initiative in Bangladesh, that's very really interesting. That indicates a lot of things are already taking place in, uh, in developing countries as well. And now uh, we'd like to uh, receive a comment from Dr. Pachoy, uh, my long-term mentor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm sorry I missed part of the session, but I had to go for uh, something important. And thank you for giving me this opportunity. Well, I think given the importance of knowledge and uh, ensuring that we move to a path of low carbon development, let me highlight the need for relevant knowledge. And this clearly means, as Lord Keynes rightly said, that it's not so much a question of learning things, but also, in a sense, unlearning some of the things that we have become accustomed to and which may not be the best way to move ahead. Uh, I would submit that there is need for us to carry out a detailed analysis of the co-benefits or for that matter the negative externalities of specific activities that we are carrying out today and which we could carry out in the future. If you take the case of Japan, this is a country where a great deal of technological development has taken place and I think much of it was driven by the need to attain energy independence and to ensure that the local uh, environment is carefully protected. And in doing so, you have developed several processes, several technologies, which I think if uh, the rest of the world were to find out about, I mean, we just heard about the example of uh, the metro that, for instance, has now come up in New Delhi. Um, it obviously benefited from the technology that had been developed in Japan and other parts in other parts of the world. Uh, and therefore, I think it enabled the authorities in Delhi and the government of India to make an enlightened choice in terms of the type of metro that uh, had to be established over there. And the benefit of this one single metro has been that now several other cities in India are also replicating the same. So I think uh, if we were to look at technological solutions that have been used in, let's say, in Japan or other parts of Asia, uh, it would give us a basis for defining what would be in our best interests. And as I said earlier during the day, uh, the benefit of some of these actions is not merely at the global level, because low carbon growth certainly will help us address the challenge of mitigation of emissions of greenhouse gases. But the benefits at the local level are huge and I think need to be quantified. Uh, the other point I'd like to make is in respect of bringing about institutional changes. You know, uh, by and large, decisions in developing countries have been taken 
at the level of the central or the federal government. Now, we need to certainly ensure that those decisions are enlightened and are to the benefit of society, but we also have to develop institutions at the local level. Uh, just to give you an example, when it comes to environmental protection, typically in most countries you have an environmental protection agency uh, or the equivalent of that at the federal level and also at the state level. There is nothing equivalent available at the local or, or very grassroots kind of level. And I think the time has come for us to ensure this kind of institution being developed at the local level as well. Decisions of various kinds, whether it comes to bylaws and, and standards for buildings, or for that matter, the transport system that has to be adopted in a particular city, is something that would have to be driven <coughs> by the local government. And hence, we need to create capacity at that level. And the flow of knowledge to ensure that has to be the main basis for bringing about that kind of institutional development. Uh, the other point I'd like to make is that we need to look at future scenarios. Uh, and this is where I think the capability and capacity of knowledge institutions in various countries has to be uh, <coughs> developed rather rapidly. Because not only should we look at what is happening today, what has happened in the, happened in the past, I think if we really want to make national choices, then we have to develop uh, compelling and carefully researched scenarios of the future. If we were to do that, then the public would be better informed about what would happen if there is a state of inaction in the future and what would be the benefits if we took the right sets of actions. So I think this kind of scenario analysis, again, has to be done at every level, at the national level, at the local level, and uh, thereby I think you would be equipping people with information and knowledge which necessarily has to be the driver of uh, action. Um, the last point I'd like to make is the need for actually uh, carrying out activities at the grassroots level. I'm very happy uh, to learn about Grameen Shakti. That's an organization that my institute partners with in a number of ways. But we ourselves have launched a program in India which has now covered about 2,000 villages and is likely to expand very rapidly called Lighting a Billion Lives. And this particular program is relying on lighting technologies, which are essentially in the form of a solar lantern or a lantern which is charged by solar energy. It uses LED. And I think it's important for us to see that technology and knowledge of a scientific nature is brought to the doorstep of the poorest of the poor, because you cannot have a major technology gap or a knowledge gap as far as the application of science and technology is concerned. Uh, I'll just end by saying that um, we are hopeful that uh, IGIS and Terry will be working together on a study of low carbon development because I think there is an enormous amount to, to learn through this kind of a joint exercise because time is of the essence. We cannot wait the next 25 years before we take in hand initiatives by which we move to a low carbon future. The time is now, and I think we have to create a knowledge platform and basis for moving in that direction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pacioli. And uh, he has, uh, in particular, emphasized the importance of local solutions and local institution building and uh, uh, a few uh, underground activities already taking place in India and other countries. Thank you very much. Then uh, may I request uh, Dr. Rohani uh, to make comments? He's Thank my you. long, long time boss. 